God, we are grateful and thankful for this day. We thank you for another opportunity that you've allowed us to come out to your house of worship one more time. God, we are grateful because through many dangers, toils, and snares, you have brought us safe thus far. So, Lord, we say thank you. Have your way in this place, we pray. We pray even now, Lord, that you will come and move by your spirit in this place. Thank you for each and every person, God, that is streaming in. And thank you for each and every person, God, that is participating in worship with us this morning. God, we pray that you bless them now in the name of Jesus. And then, God, when you move, we'll give you glory. When you have your way, we'll give you glory because you alone are worthy of of our praise and so we lift you God we magnify you we exalt you we extol you we glorify you God for you alone are worthy to be praised this is our prayer we pray it now in Jesus name let every heart say amen our scripture this morning comes from Psalm 61 hear my cry O God listen to my prayer from the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto our God. Good morning. 
I call your attention to this morning's announcements. Please join us at 7 a.m. on Sunday and Wednesday mornings for our St. John's Family Prayer Call, led by Pastor Wallace. The dial-in number is 425-436-6308, access code 312-522. Join Pastor Wallace and the St. John's Family every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. on Tap On Radio, 1070 on the AM dial. You can download the Tap On Radio app, click on radio, and click on the broadcast. Join us on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. for Zoom Bible study. An email notification is sent out on Tuesdays. However, if you do not currently receive notifications from the church, please call or email us your email address so we can add you to the weekly invite. St. John's will be celebrating their 111th church anniversary on Sunday, May 24th. Be sure to tune in as we will have a special guest speaker. Please remember, if you are in need, the church is here for you. Please call the church and leave a detailed message and a deacon will be in touch with you. If you find that our services have been a blessing to you, and if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do so and click the notification button so you receive an alert when new services are posted. Please remember to pray for the sick and the elderly. They need our prayers more now than ever before. We are excited to share two special anniversaries. Deacon William and Carol Saunders celebrated their 61st wedding anniversary on April 12th, Ruby and Dalton Simmons celebrated their 63rd wedding anniversary this week. Congratulations to both couples and may God continue to bless each of you. Remember, here at the Dome, the building may be closed, but the church is still open. We wish you and your family good health, stay safe, and be strong as we will get through this together. Have a blessed day. Thank you for all of your continued support financially to the church, whether you've been giving online through Simple Give or by mailing in your tithes and offerings, or if you stopped by with your gift yesterday, we pray that you enjoyed the special gift that we gave to you. We thank you for your continued stewardship. Thank you again for joining us in worship, and now we pray that you'll enjoy a selection from our virtual choir. I 
everything that have breath, praise Him, He's holy. praise on you. God, again, we're grateful and we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that you have given us to share with your people. Now, God, we pray that you will sit us down, that you might stand up. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us, melt us, mold us, shape us, make us, break us if you have to, Lord. But whatever you do, use us for your service that some will be saved and others might be revived. Pray this prayer in the name of he who died one Friday evening, but rose triumphantly Sunday morning. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Let all of God's people say, amen. Amen. Second Corinthians, the 12th chapter, second Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse seven, concluding with verse 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto our God. I want to talk from this thought this morning, make it stop, make it stop. Paul writes this second missive to the church in Corinth. In the 12th chapter, he begins by telling a story about a man who 14 years ago was given the privilege of being caught up into the third heaven. The first heaven deals with Earth's Earth's atmosphere. The second heaven deals with outer space. The third heaven deals with the dwelling place of God. So Paul uh, tells us how this man was caught up in the dwelling place of God. He continues by saying, I don't know if he was taken there in the body. I don't know if he had some kind of outer body experience. Only God knows the details of his excursion. But what I do know is that this man had the privilege of visiting paradise. Paradise, that place that Jesus tells the man on the cross that he would soon be going to. Paradise, that walled garden where you can eat of the tree of life. And Paul says that this man heard some things and he saw some things that could not be uttered. There were some things that was experienced in paradise that he was unable to talk about on earth. Paul continues by saying, on behalf of this man, I will boast because after all, it's not every day that somebody gets the opportunity to experience the dwelling place of God. God dwells with us, 
but how often do we experience going to where God lives? Somebody who's had that type of experience has a reason to boast because they've been granted the privilege of visions and revelations that the average person just does not receive. Paul says, but as for me, I can only boast on my weaknesses. So now I'm reading this passage of scripture and I'm beginning to wonder why is Paul so fascinated with the story of this man and as I continue reading, it dawns on me that Paul could actually be talking about himself. In fact, verse 6 begins to allude to this possibility, but then verse 7 clarifies it for us. Paul begins this story by talking in third person, but by the time he gets to the seventh verse, he's clearly talking in first person. I like the way the English Standard Version renders this verse. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in my flesh. Paul says, look, I've experienced some things in life that very few people have had the opportunity to experience. I sat at the feet of arguably one of the greatest Jewish teachers in history, Gamaliel. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a rabbi in my own right. I'm a master teacher of the law. I have dual citizenship that permits me in and out of places and in and out of the company of people that few can only lay, lay claim to. I've argued on Mars Hill, the educational mecca of the world. I've been taken to the third heaven. I've heard some things. I've seen some things. I've experienced some things that I'm not even at liberty to reveal or repeat again. If there's anyone who had a reason to boast, it would be Paul. He says, but I can only boast in my weaknesses because there's this problem. There's this issue that I'm dealing with. There's this situation going on in my flesh even though I've experienced all these things I have a thorn in my flesh even though I could brag about what I've done and who I am I got a thorn in my flesh even though I've experienced great revelations I've got a thorn in my flesh you do know what a thorn is don't you it's that sharp, woody spine that causes pain and irritation and discomfort. When we think of a thorn, we think of roses that have thorns on its stem and how you have to be careful how you handle them lest you get stuck in your hand. When we think of thorns, we think of walking through the weeds and those little prickly things, those round balls of thorny spikes that stick to your socks or your pants. When we think of thorns, we think of splinters of wood that stick us in the finger or the toe and cause us to be irritated. But the wording here refers to more than just a small irritation. The word thorn rendered here in this text is more like a stake than it is a splinter. Visualize, if you will, a tent stake that according to Dr. Warren Wiersbe was used to torture someone. It was an affliction of some kind that brought about discomfort and pain. And the text tells us he wasn't just pricked with the thorn, but that this thorn was embedded in his flesh. It wasn't just a temporary situation, but rather a long-lasting affliction. It wasn't a little splinter that could easily be taken out with a tweezer, but rather it was a lengthy spike that was logged into his flesh. Paul was dealing with pain. Somebody here under the sound of my voice can probably relate to that because if I poll those streaming with us this morning, I got a sneaky suspicion that there are some folks under the sound of my voice who have dealt with some pain. In fact, there are probably some folks right now dealing with some pain. Not a prick of pain. Not a stick of pain. But I'm talking about embedded pain. Pain that has taken up residence in your life. Pain that never goes on vacation. 
Pain that's consistent and constant. Pain that's aggravating and agitating. Pain that's hurtful and harmful. Pain that seems to be killing you softly. And when you've been dealing with pain any length of time, it'll make you want to throw up both your hands and holler, make it stop. I've been hurting long enough. Make it stop. I've been suffering long enough. Make it stop. I've been dealing with it long enough. Make it stop. I can't take another death. I can't take another loved one getting sick. I can't take another bad report from the government regarding coronavirus. Make it stop. Enough is enough. I'm at my wit's end. I'm fit to be tired. I'm, I'm through. I can't handle it anymore. Make it stop. I'm talking about the kind of pain that has the ability to alter your whole life. And change your whole way of thinking. And if you've never experienced any pain like this, keep on living. Because pain is universal. Pain comes down everybody's street. Pain knocks on everybody's door. Pain will walk into everybody's house and wreak havoc in everybody's life. And the ironic thing is that Paul doesn't tell us what his thorn is. We don't know what Paul's thorn was, but what we do know is that his thorn was painful. Some theologians suggest that maybe Paul suffered from poor eyesight. Some say that he suffered from epilepsy and he had chronic headaches. Others say that he suffered from feelings of guilt and depression. Some say that Paul had a speech impediment and he dealt with a lust problem. Some others say that he had physical problems related to his persecutions. Or maybe it was the persecutors that caused him pain. We don't know exactly what it was, but all that we know is that it pained Paul to the point that he wanted it to stop. And I don't know what the thorn might be in your life that's causing you pain. I don't know what it is that's embedded in your flesh. That's inflicting you. It could be an illness. It could be a person or people. It could be a prevailing mindset or attitude. It could be your family. It could be some of your friends. It could be your personal demons that you're dealing with. It could be your own insecurities, your own failures, your own disappointments. It could be anything, something, everything related to this pandemic. But no matter what it is, all of us want it to stop. Well, um, if that's you, I stopped by this morning to share with you that I saw a couple things here in the text that should shed some light on the thorns in your life. Uh, the first thing I saw, according to verse 7, is that even though the thorns are painful, they're purposeful. I'm going to say that again. Uh, even though the thorns are painful, they are purposeful. My brothers and sisters, I know that this may be a hard pill to swallow, but somebody needs to know that your pain is on purpose. You see, we want the pain to stop, not fully understanding that the pain has a purpose. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, has a purpose watch this and not just any purpose but a God ordained and God controlled purpose and even when we don't understand what the purpose is now the songwriter said we'll understand it better by and by the, the only thing um, going through our minds is how unbearable it is how how, how much pain this thorn is causing us and all we want it to do is stop but what we don't understand is that the thorn exists for a reason and that somehow some way it has a purpose for our lives there's a purpose behind negroes that keep getting on your nerves people that keep talking about you people that keep taking you for granted there's a purpose for the suffering that you're dealing with and the suffering that you're going through. There's a purpose for you being where you are in your life. There's a purpose for that body that's racked with pain. There's a purpose for what's happening with your family. There's a purpose for the pain, for the problem, for the pandemic, and for this predicament that we're in. God has a purpose. 
Paul says that in order to keep him humble, in order to keep him from getting the big head, in order to keep him from becoming conceited, a thorn was embedded in his flesh. And I don't know why your thorn is in your flesh. And I don't know why my thorn is in my flesh. But what I do know is that it's there for a purpose. It goes on to say, a messenger of Satan to harass me or buffet me. This thorn came from Satan who was allowed to torment Paul. Paul was being beaten and Paul was being battered, but God allowed it to be so. And somebody needs to know today that the attack is coming from the adversary. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and rulers and authorities uh, in darkness and against spiritual forces in high places. Uh, even though it's coming from the adversary, it's only coming because God allowed it. Yeah, uh, that means that God said, go ahead and afflict them. Go ahead and harass them. Go ahead and plant the thorn in their flesh. Go ahead and do it because I said so. The problem is we want it all to stop, but don't understand what God is doing through our affliction. We want to make it stop not realizing that it's God who's allowing it to happen in the first place. It's happening on purpose for a purpose. Sometimes the enemy is allowed to buffet us, inflict us, because if he didn't, we'd get conceited. If he didn't, we'd get too comfortable. If he didn't, we become careless. If he didn't, we become cocky. If he didn't, we would become conditioned to how things are and maintaining the status quo. We might get sidetracked. We might put our guard down. We might take our armor off. We too would take God for granted. We too might forget our purpose and our responsibility. God allowed the enemy to buffet Paul with a thorn in his flesh. And so Paul, just like you and I, prayed to God and said, Lord, make it stop. The first time he goes to God and pleads with him, please make it stop. And the Bible gives no indication as to how long he waited on God to respond to his request. So he persistently goes to the Lord a second time and says, Lord, I'm begging for you to make it stop. Again, there's no time frame that's shared with us regarding how long he waited. But he says a third time to the Lord, I can't take it no more. Would you please make it stop? And finally, Paul gets a response from God regarding his prayer. God says, I'm not going to remove the thorn. There's two reasons here why you need to know I'm not going to remove this thorn. Number one, the reason why I'm not going to remove the thorn is because my grace is sufficient for you. Wait, God. Um, I asked you to remove a thorn. What is this talk about grace? Uh, years ago, there was a question asked at a conference. What makes Christianity different from other world religions? Some argued it was the uniqueness of God becoming a man. Someone objected and said, no, other religions teach that too. Someone else said, well, Maybe it's the resurrection. No, they said it was argued other faiths believe that the dead rise again. The discussion grew heated, and just as it was growing heated, they tell me that C.S. Lewis walked in late and asked them, what is all the fuss about? When he learned of the question immediately, he said, oh, that's easy. The thing that makes Christianity unique from all other religions is grace. Grace, God's unmerited favor. 
Grace, when God gives us what we don't deserve. Grace, God's redemption at Christ's expense. Somebody ought to shout, thank God for his grace. There was a little boy who went to Sunday school, and the topic of the day was grace. He went home and asked his mama, mama, what is grace? She said, it's what you do three times a day before you eat your breakfast, your lunch, and your dinner. He went to his daddy and said, daddy, what is grace? He said, it's when your mortgage payment is due on the first of the month, but they give you until the 15th of the month to pay it off. Not quite satisfied with either of those two answers. He went to his grandmama and said, Grandma, what is grace? Grandma replied, I'm over 80 years old. And though my eyesight has gotten dim, I can still see. Though my hearing has gotten worse, I can still hear. She got up holding a cane in her hand and said, though I use a cane, I'm still walking. That's grace. I wish I had somebody. And God told Paul that my grace is sufficient for you. The present tense reveals that there's a constant availability of God's grace. Y'all missed a real good reason to shout. That means that God's grace never runs out. God's grace never takes a break. God's grace never has to play favorites. It's sufficient for your pain. It's sufficient for my pain. It's sufficient for your suffering. It's sufficient for my suffering. It's good for your problem. It's good for my problem. It's good for your issue. It's good for my issue. It's good for your circumstance. It's good for my circumstance. It's sufficient for the thorns in your flesh. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. And somebody under the sound of my voice needs to know that that thorn in your flesh may not be removed. And if it's not removed, it's all right because God's grace is sufficient for you. But then the second thing, and I'm done. He says, not only is my grace sufficient for you, but my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Not only do we get the opportunity to experience the grace of God, but then we also get the opportunity to experience the power of God through his strength. Notice, if you will, I didn't say my strength. I didn't say your strength. But I said God's strength. God says my strength or my power is made perfect in your weakness. In other words, when you're at your weakest point, that's when you have the privilege of experiencing God's power. There was a 10-year-old boy who decided to study judo. Despite the fact that he had lost his left arm in a devastating car accident. The boy began lessons with an old Japanese judo master. The boy was doing well, so he couldn't understand why after three months of training, the master had taught him only one move. Master, the boy finally said, shouldn't I learn more moves? I realized that this is the only move you know the master said, but uh, you're going to need this move uh, in order to fight. Not quite understanding, but believing in his teacher, the boy kept on training. Several months later, the master took the boy to his first tournament. Surprising himself, the boy easily won his first, second, and third match. And the boy made it all the way to the finals. <clears throat> This time, his opponent was bigger. His opponent was stronger. His opponent was more experienced. And for a while, the boy appeared to be overmatched. 
concerned that the boy might get hurt, the referee called a timeout. He was about to stop the match when the master intervened. No, the master insisted, let him continue with the fight. As soon as the match resumed, his opponent rushed in on him. Instantly, the boy used his one move to pin his opponent. The boy won the match and the boy won the tournament. On the way home, the boy asked the master, he said, Master, how could I possibly have won this tournament with only one move? The master turned and looked at the boy and said, you won for two reasons. Number one, you've been able to master the most difficult throw in all of Judah. Uh, and secondly, uh, the only known defense for the move that you mastered uh, is that your opponent has to be able to grab uh, your left arm. Y'all missed the greatest reason to shout right there. Uh, the boy's biggest weakness uh, had become his biggest strength. Uh, and that's all I came to tell y'all this morning. Uh, even when you want God to make it stop, uh, remember that God's grace... Uh, is sufficient for you and remember that his strength his powers made perfect in our weakness because when we're weak that's when God is strong that's why in our greatest weakness God's strength is made perfect for the Bible says while we were yet sinners Christ died for you and for me and on a hill uh, far away uh, stood an old rugged cross, uh, the emblem of, of suffering and shame. Uh, they nailed his hands. Uh, they nailed his feet. Uh, he bowed his head uh, and the locks of his shoulders. Uh, and he died. Uh, he died uh, until the earth shook uh, like a drunken man. Uh, he died uh, until the S-O-N uh, outshined the S-U-N. Uh, he died uh, until death had to apologize. Uh, but early Sunday morning, uh, he got up uh, with all power uh, in his hand. Uh, and you and I uh, need to be reminded uh, that if he never uh, makes it stop uh, if he never uh, makes it stop uh, if he never uh, makes it stop uh, his power uh, his strength uh, is made perfect uh, in our weakness uh, even um, if it doesn't make it go away uh, you and I uh, could make it uh, because his grace uh, and his strength uh, are sufficient for you and me. God is the source and the strength of my life. He moves all pain, misery, and strife. He promised to keep me, never to leave me, never ever fall short of his word. I've got to fast and pray, stay in the narrow way. Keep my life clean uh, every day. Uh, I want to go with him. When he comes back, uh, I've gone too far. Uh, I'll never turn back. Uh, God, uh, God, uh, God uh, is. God is my everything. He's my joy in sorrow. He's my hope for tomorrow. He's my rock in a weary land. He's my shelter in the time of storm. God is my everything, your everything, our everything. And even if he never makes it stop, his grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in our weakness. And my brothers and sisters, that's good news because let's be honest, we want it to stop, 
I mean, when you've been going through for a long time, when you have been dealing with your issue for however long you've dealt with it, the truth is we want it to stop. <clears throat> God, when you gonna make it stop? When you, when you gonna make these people stop and do the right thing? God, when you gonna make them stop getting on my nerves? God, when you gonna make them stop doing, when are you gonna make it stop? God says, I may not ever make it stop, but I'm gonna give you some grace. My grace will be sufficient for you. I'm going to give you my power. That'll be made perfect in your weakness. And then you'll be able to say, I can do all things. Through Christ strengthens me. God, we're grateful and we thank you. Thank you, God, because in our humanity, we just want you to make it stop. That's We, we want you to... Make it so we don't have to suffer no more. Make it so we don't have to go through. Make it so we don't have to deal with whatever we're dealing with. And sometimes, God, we miss out on the blessing that you've given us in our burden. Sometimes we miss out on the purpose of the pain that we're dealing with. Sometimes we miss out on the real salvation that is coming from our suffering. And so, God, we pray that you remind us that your grace is sufficient for us and that your power, your strength is made perfect even when we're weak. And so, God, I pray, I pray now for each and every person that might be listening to this broadcast. I pray for every person, God, that may be on the other side of that TV screen somebody that has dealt with a thorn in their flesh and Lord I don't know what the thorn is but I know that you're able you're able to keep us when we can't keep ourselves you're able to deliver us even in the midst of the storm you're able to take care of us even if you don't remove it so God we thank you because this is what we realize. We realize, God, that either way, we're good. We're good if you take it away. But then we're good if we keep it because we know that you're strengthening us at the very moment that you have us going through. So, God, we're grateful. And we thank you. Bless your people now, I pray. From the crown of their head, even now to the sole of their feet. Empower them now, God, in the matchless name of Jesus. Let them know that nothing happens by mistake, but you still have the world in the palm of your hand. Thank you, we pray, in the matchless name of Jesus. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth and forevermore. Let every heart say amen at this time we want to prepare our hearts and minds so that we might enter into our communion service together my brothers and sisters we want to welcome you uh, to St. John's Baptist Church for our communion service um, at this time in our lives when we're dealing with social distancing and we're unable to be together one with another uh, we still want to share in the Lord's Supper together uh, you may not have the elements with you. You may not have the wafer or the cracker or the grape juice or wine with you. But you can certainly find whatever it is that you do have to share in this time together. Remember, communion is symbolic. It is a representation of the body of Christ and a representation of the blood of Jesus. And so you may not have exactly what I have, but take whatever you have and use it for the glory of God. Let us open up with our scripture. First Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23. For I have received from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and said, let us eat of this bread and drink of this cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. Let us pray. God, we're grateful and we thank you for this time and this opportunity that you've allowed us to share together in communion. You told us that as often as we do this, we show forth our remembrance of what you did for us on Calvary. God, allow this to be an opportunity for self-reflection and self-inventory. Help us, God, to look at ourselves and to look at our relationship with you and uh, discover, God, that all of us need an opportunity, God, to be closer to you. God, we're grateful and we thank you for the blood that was shed. We thank you for your body that was broken just for us. And God, we pray that you will take all of our natural elements and give them a spiritual use. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let every heart say, Amen. On that evening, after Jesus took the bread, he blessed the bread. And after he broke the bread, he said, this is my body, broken for many. Take it. Eat all of it. After they ate together, he took the wine and said, this is my blood, which is shed for many. Take it. Drink ye all of it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name. After they ate and they drank together, the Bible says that they went out into the Mount of Olives singing a hymn. And we don't know what hymn that they sang, but what we do know is that we were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So thank you for joining us in this communion service. And let us go out praying together. God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for what you did for us on Calvary. We pray, God, that in the name of Jesus, you would bless every effort that we have and everything that we're doing for you. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, Rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth, and forevermore. Let every heart say, Amen. Welcome to the St. John's Baptist Church online giving in one minute demo. If you already have a simple give account, be sure to log in with your account information to store your giving in your account history. Let's get started and head over to our church website at www.stjohnscotchplains.org. Once you are on the landing page, you will select the giving tab from the information bar. From here, you will be taken to our Simple Give page. Once on Simple Give, you will select the fund to which you wish to give, such as tithes, benevolence, or other. Next, you will enter the gift amount you wish to give. Lastly, please enter your information and press the Submit tab. Once submitted, you will receive immediate confirmation of your gift. On behalf of our pastor, the Reverend Sean T. Wallace Sr., and the St. John's family, we thank you for your gift and pray God's blessings for you and your family.